this form. We've talked about how they erupt. But now what I want to do is get into the processes by which magmas change. And so let's call this magma chamber dynamics. And really, we're into the processes of change, which get summarized as AFC processes most of the time. Now, AFC stands for Assimilation Fractional Crystallization. And each one of those has 10 letters, and they're a total mouthful. So in this class, we say AFC processes when we're actually trying to say assimilation. Oh my gosh, I don't want to have to write this out many times. Fractional crystallization. This is a useful acronym. Now in the textbook where we're talking about these magma chamber dynamics and AFC processes, we're looking at pages 24 to 25. There's a lot of different places, 33 to 36 and 160 to 162 and 178 to 181 and 316 to 318 and they're totally worth your time because they're going to give you a different perspective than what I say and that might be really helpful for your learning. Now the other big theme for this series of lectures about magma chambers is that we want to have evidence to understand those dynamics and so we're going to look for textures and we're going to look for composition. All right so I guess our lines of evidence will be both textural and compositional for each one of these. Now we know that there are all sorts of different compositions out there. And so if we return to the TAS diagram, which is what we've seen before as the way that we put rock names compositionally for volcanic systems, we could look at the at 41,000 different rocks plotted from all across Earth. And what we see is that more than half of the rocks on planet Earth end up clustering in this kind of domain space here. And then so there must be processes that control this distribution. And there are also those processes must allow for these weirder end members. And it's those processes today that we're going to get into. Uh, another kind of cartoon, although we don't say the word cartoon in geology anymore, we use schematic diagram because cartoons are supposed to be funny. We're going to use this schematic diagram to illustrate the processes where we can have things like magma mixing going on. So this panel is illustrating mixing. How we can take body A, oh body B, it already says B right there, and mix it into chamber A and create a hybrid melt. We can also change the composition of magma by fractional crystallization, where crystals form from the magma, they nucleate and grow, and then they sink down to the base of the chamber, changing the resulting composition. You can also partially melt, right? You can imagine all the heat that's radiating off this magma chamber, and you can partially melt the, the country rock and change magma chamber that way, okay? So we're gonna get into fractional crystallization, partial melting, and magma mixing. And to start off, Let's begin with magma mix. And this will be Roman numeral one in our notes. And there really is no definition that's needed to supplement magma mixing. We're taking two bodies, putting them together. And what this does is it produces change. And specifically, the change that it produces is in composition. Right? If you mix a basalt and a rhyolite together, you're going to get some hybrid. And you're also going to get changes in temperature. Take a 1200 degree magma chamber and mix it with an 800 degree magma chamber. We're going to get some temperature between the two. The other variable that we need to consider with magma mixing is density. Because one magma is going to be more mafic, which is more dense. Another magma will probably be more rhyolitic and less dense. And this density is really going to drive the efficiency of mixing, as well as convective stirring. Okay, these are the two processes that are going to allow magma, uh, sorry, convective stirring. Oh, that's real sloppy. You're not going to like that. Let's do it here. Stirring. These are the things, and we're going to put some arrows here. All right, so if we have convective stirring, we can mix magmas together. If we don't have good density change, and if we don't have convective stir stirring, then we won't actually get magmas to mix efficiently. The schematic I want you to have in your mind, in fact, you should pause this video right now and go ahead and reproduce this drawing from our textbook to illustrate magma mixing. And what we see, the, the main points, right, is that we're going to have, we have a silicic magma, and we have intruding in is a mafic magma. And this has a greater density 
than the silicic magma. And so it stays stuck on the towards the base of the chamber. And we are not going to get efficient mixing unless this environment is turbulent, which will convectively stir and mix things all together. This convective stirring, right, you should label that here, convective stirring, will homogenize this into a single resulting magma. And it will, in that process, will rip off blebs. If we can imagine like a little bleb coming up here off the mafic, and it detaches and then it gets incorporated into the magma. These little blebs are called enclaves. And enclaves are often seen in magma. So what we need to do is we're getting into right now the uh, textural and compositional um, effects of this process. And we'll start actually with composition. So I have this as A. The main compositional way we can describe this process is tend to be done using a Harker variation diagram. Harker variation diagram. These have been used for about a hundred years, named after a petrologist, the last name Harker. And what Harker did was establish that a simple XY diagram can be used to understand petrologic processes. For example, if we're plotting the composition of a magma in SiO2 versus MgO, we could have a starting magma. Let's say our starting magma is a rhyolite. So this is rhyolite. Light and it has you know uh, 75 weight percent uh, SiO2 and it hardly has any MgO like let's say one M. But if we mix into that rhyolite magma a basalt, well where would basalt be on this two-axis diagram? Well, basalts are lower SiO2 and they're higher MgO, so this could be an intruding basalt. And if we mix the two of these together, the mixture is going to fall somewhere along the line, the tie line, that connects the two. All right, the hybrid has to be somewhere along that line. And it's going to depend on how much basalt we mix to that rhyolite. If we mix in only one drop of basalt to the rhyolite, well, the resultant, the hybrid, will only be here. But if we mix 50-50, maybe it's somewhere here. So what we'll do is we'll just say it was like 70-30, just in this random example. And so what we end up having on this Harker variation diagram by intruding basalt and mi magma mixing it into rhyolite, we produce a hybrid that falls along the connecting line. Right? where what we've done is we've changed the composition in this direction. That's all a Harker variation diagram is, and it can be used to describe magma mixing. You're going to find out that it can also be used to describe, so we're going to say this is magma mixing example. We're going to also use Harker variation diagrams to explain fractional crystallization and, what's the other one? Oh, assimilation processes. Okay, that is a nice geochemistry example to understand magma mixing. Now let's get into texture. What can we see in the field or in thin section that demonstrates that magma mixing occurs? So we're going to say this is textural evidence. I already told you that enclaves occur, so let's start with enclaves. Enclaves in the picture above, it was like this droplet that detaches from the intruding basaltic magma and gets incorporated as an isolated island floating through the silicic magma. And that's what an enclave is. It's this fluidal, which means it's still molten. Um, I don't know if bleb is the right word, right? But a detached body of mafic melt that ends up getting quenched within the silicic uh, chamber. Here's just like a good example. I think uh, I think this is from the Sierra Nevada in California, where fluid blebs of mafic melt have detached from an intruding basalt and then quenched against the um, the host silicic magma. And what we see when we get enclaves, if you were to draw an enclave, maybe to yourself, you'd make sure you draw something like this that has fluidal margins, which tells you that it was quenched. It was liquid that becomes solid. And what this body does is it contributes, let's, and we're going to put these words, it contributes chemicals, so compositionally, and temperature, heat, to um, the surrounding. So you could imagine like it's contributing these materials as it's 
being digested. That might be another good way. This could become digested into the main body. But we see different parts of uh, that story frozen in the act. So that's one of the textures you're going to look for. Another texture that you're going to see, maybe more in thin section than hand sample, is crystal zonation. Crystals respond to the changing magma chamber and will record that um, in their chemistry and in their form. So let's say something along the lines of, um, see the stable, that means the thermodynamically stable, crystallizing forms will respond to magma chain, changes in the magma. We have, we have four examples of these, and then the lecture is over. I think a good one to start with would be um, resorption. Resorption is that digestion. It's the decay because of disequilibrium. So let's put that decay caused by disequilibrium. Maybe the temperature, so an example could be the temperature goes up. And in this example, we had beautiful bipyramidal beta quartz in equilibrium and nice and euhedral. But with an increase in temperature going up, here's the outline of what we had. It was this beautiful euhedral, but it started to be digested and resorbed. And so the resulting crystal is just this anhedral wormy thing anhedral. That would be a good example to co that comes to your mind when we're talking about resorption of a crystal. That So it's a record preserved in the rock, in the, in the mineral assemblage of magma mixing. Maybe of temperature increase or it was a high SiO2 system that then goes to more mafic and so the quartz is no longer stable. Okay, another crystal record is zonation. Crystal zonation. What I mean by this is that the minerals themselves change like tree rings, basically, to the change in magma chamber. We have two different types of zonation that we can deal with. We have continuous zonation, and then we have oscillatory zonation preserved in crystals. We'll underline each of these. This so so this is best shown in plagioclase, in my opinion. So if we were to draw a plagioclase crystal with oscillatory zoning, aka tree rings, the tree rings of the crystal, the growth zones would be a way to say that, have different um, extinction in cross polars. That's one really nice way to see it petrographically. And so in plagioclase, we see these kind of concentric zones which represent changing conditions in the magma chamber. So let's just say that this example I drew here is an example of plage, and we see different extinction with composition. You can also see plagioclase with continuous zonation, and here the events are not punctuated in an oscillatory form, and instead what we get is like the core might go extinct. This is going to be easier to do with a pencil. Um, and then as you go away from the core, it gets less and less pronounced, the, the amount of like extinction, and it's, it's just really smooth gradient. Uh, it's a little harder to draw with this pen because I can't show pressure. But here what we have is kind of a smooth gradation. And both of these show changes in the magma chamber. Now in this example, it was plagioclase for both of them, but it doesn't have to be. Many different minerals show zonations. And then the last thing actually, here's the last type. The last type of texture we see for magma mixing is crystal rims. And these are basically overgrowths of one crystal upon another. Let's see, we're gonna say, and, and this tends to be, whereas zonation tends to be more of a, um, long time period, maybe gradual changes over tens of thousands of years. Crystal rims are more, they reflect more sudden changes in a chamber. 
One of the more famous types involves plagioclase, and it's called Rapakivi texture. This is a fun one to say. I want you to know Rapakivi. Rapakivi. You might be able to show your family members at Thanksgiving Rapakivi texture because it's in granites, and granites are countertops. So this is a neat one to learn. You can tell a story of petrology. With Rapakivi texture, it is plagioclase rims case bar. That's as simple as, as I can describe it. And so if you have a plagioclase, nope, sorry, if you have a case bar crystal, let's call it microcline, and it has that, in thin section, it's got that cross-hatch twinning, right? That's how I'm drawing it here. Now, in hand sample, what you'd end up seeing is probably the pink microcline. In fact, let's go ahead and put microcline, might be what you see. The magma chamber conditions will change, and an overgrowth will occur on top of that core of microcline that is plagioclase. And we'll just draw plagioclase like this. And so maybe this will be like, this could be white color because plage is more white or gray, and this could be pink. It's a dead giveaway that you're looking at rapid kiwi texture. And the reason for it tends to be that plage is more mafic. And so maybe this shows that there is an influx of more mafic melt. Mafic melt. And it controls what type of feldspar mineral is forming. Well, I think that's a good place to end. And we'll pick up next time with fractional crystallization and assimilation.